Bye bye. Adios. <laughs> Come back, ma'am. Come back. Come one will be ten thousand. Are you serious? I am serious. Adios. <laughs> It's hard to imagine children committing heinous crimes, but unfortunately, it's a reality. There have been numerous cases where young offenders have committed such atrocities that they've been tried and sentenced as adults. Despite their cold-hearted actions, some of these kids broke down and showed raw emotion when they received their sentences. <laughs> Others, however, displayed a defiant and unremorseful attitude. I just want to tell y'all, I'll be home soon, or I'll be Keon, I love my family. These stories are not for the faint-hearted, but they shed light on the disturbing realities of juvenile crime. Some of these reactions are shocking, while others are heartbreaking. It's important to note that all of these kids and teenagers committed crimes and were punished by the court. Watching their children go to prison for such a long time was not easy for their families, but they could not do anything because the crimes these kids committed were horrific and unforgivable. This is how teenage convicts reacted after hearing their sentences. Number 1. John Freeman John Freeman, a teenager from New York, was sentenced to 22 years to life in prison for taking the life of 5-year-old Isabella Tennant. Freeman had lured Isabella into a secluded area where he proceeded to assault her with a rock. He then tried to cover up the crime by hiding her body under debris. Freeman's background revealed a troubled past with a history of mental health issues and a family history of substance abuse. He had previously been admitted to a psychiatric facility for threatening to take his sister's life. During his trial, Freeman pleaded guilty to second degree and tampering with physical evidence. The judge presiding over the case called the crime heinous and said that Freeman had shown no remorse for his actions. At his sentencing, Freeman showed no visible emotion and declined the opportunity to address the court. Isabella's family members, however, spoke out against Freeman, with her mother calling him a monster and saying that he had stolen the light from our lives. Her aunt also spoke, stating that Isabella will always be loved, missed, and never forgotten. In the footage of the sentencing, Isabella's family members can be heard crying as the judge delivers the sentence to Freeman. He spoke in cold detail of how, with his bare hands, he murdered a defenseless five-year-old girl. The case had a significant impact on the community, with many expressing shock and sadness over the senseless act of violence committed against an innocent child. Number 2. Nicholas Cruz Nicholas Cruz is an American convict responsible for several deaths. He was responsible for the 2018 Parkland school shooting. Born on September 24, 1998 in Margate, Florida, he was adopted at a young age and had a troubled childhood. Cruz had a history of behavioral problems and he was diagnosed with several mental health disorders, including depression, ADHD, and an autism spectrum disorder. He had been expelled from Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, where he later carried out his horrific crime. On February 14, 2018, Cruz walked into Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School armed with an AR-15 rifle and began shooting indiscriminately, taking the lives of 17 people and injuring 17 others. He then fled the scene and was later apprehended by police. Cruz confessed to the crime and was charged with premeditation and attempting to take the lives of his fellow students. In March 2018, Cruz's defense team offered a guilty plea in exchange for a life sentence without parole, which was rejected by prosecutors. Adjudicated of 17 counts of murder in the first degree, the jury having returned a verdict of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, is there any legal reason why I should not impose a sentence at this time? In 2019, a jury found Cruz guilty on all counts, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Cruz showed no emotion as the sentence was read. In a statement read out in court by his attorney, Cruz expressed remorse for his actions, saying, I am sorry for what I did. I have to live with this every single day, and it brings me nightmares. I am very sorry for what I did, and I have to live with it every day, and that if I were to get a second chance, I would do everything in my power to try to help others. I have to live with this every day and brings me nightmares and I can't live with myself sometimes, but I try to push through. However, the families of the victims were not convinced by his apology and some of them expressed anger at the sentence, feeling that it was not harsh enough for the severity of the crime. I hope and pray he receives the kind of mercy from prisoners 
that he showed to my daughter and the 16 others. He is going to go to prison and he will die in prison. Number three, Dante Wright. Dante Wright was a 17-year-old high school student who was involved in the death of 18-year-old Jordan Klee in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Wright had previously pleaded guilty to second degree and carrying a concealed weapon in connection with the fatal shooting of Klee. The incident took place in December of 2016 when Wright and two other individuals attempted to rob Klee at gunpoint, leading to his death. At his sentencing hearing, Wright showed a lack of remorse for his actions, even smiling and nearly laughing during the proceedings. The judge presiding over the case admonished Wright for his behavior and lack of accountability, stating that he had never seen a defendant show such disrespect in his courtroom. Sentenced by the parties, but watching you sit there, smile and laugh and shake your head like this was no big deal, I'm very tempted to just say, I'm not going to accept this sentence agreement. We'll go to trial. And if you're convicted of felony murder, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. That means you'll die there. That's what I'm tempted to do. Despite Wright's young age, Judge Schwartz sentenced him to a minimum of 25 to 52 years in prison, calling his actions heinous and inexcusable. Wright's co-defendants, Jamarius Ellison and Delranio Gracie, were also sentenced to prison for their involvement in the crime. Wright did not show much emotion or regret. The case received significant media attention due to the shocking nature of the crime and Wright's disrespectful behavior in court. At Wright's sentencing hearing, the victim's family spoke about the impact of Klee's death on their lives. Klee's father expressed his grief and anger at Wright, calling him a monster and a coward. Klee's mother said that her son's death had left a huge hole in their lives and that they would never fully recover from their loss. Number 4. Nicholas Lindsay Nicholas Lindsay is a convicted criminal who was involved in the death of St. Petersburg police officer David Crawford in February of 2011. Lindsay was just 16 years old at the time of the crime. He had a history of juvenile offenses and was on probation when he committed the horrific crime. Nicholas Lindsay had a problematic background as a young person. He had a history of nonviolent offenses, such as grand theft and trespassing, as documented in his records. Although he did attend school for the day of the incident, he had a significant number of absences, having missed 40 days during that school year. During a 2010 outreach, a community event, St. Petersburg Mayor Bill Foster visited Lindsay's home and recognized him from his mugshot after his first arrest for grand theft. Foster was impressed by Lindsay's demeanor and aspirations for success, and he advocated for Lindsay to be tried as an adult. On February 21, 2011, Officer Crawford responded to a call about a suspicious person in a local neighborhood. He encountered Lindsay and began to question him when Lindsay pulled out a handgun and assaulted the unsuspecting officer. Officer Crawford was rushed to the hospital but succumbed to his injuries. Lindsay was charged with first degree and faced life in prison without parole. He was found guilty by a jury in March of 2012 and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in April of 2012. This sentence was controversial as Lindsay was a juvenile at the time of the murder and his attorneys argued that he should have been given the chance for parole at some point. As the judge announced his sentence, Lindsay could be seen smiling and laughing, which drew a sharp rebuke from the judge. The judge told Lindsay that his behavior was unacceptable and that he had taken a life senselessly and needlessly. The judge then imposed the sentence of life in prison without parole. Number 5. Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero, both 18, were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the brutal death of Halseth's father, Daniel Halseth. The couple had planned the crime for weeks, eventually stabbing the victim multiple times. His body was found dismembered. Halseth and Guerrero were both raised in Las Vegas and had been dating for several months before the incident. Guerrero was known to have a troubled past, including a history of drug abuse and previous runs-ins with the law. Halseth, on the other hand, was a straight-A student and had no prior criminal record. The couple was charged with taking Halseth's life, conspiracy, and robbery with the use of a deadly weapon. They both pleaded guilty to the charges and were sentenced in June of 2021. During the sentencing hearing, both Halseth and Guerrero showed little emotion, with Halseth appearing to smirk at the cameras and Guerrero staring blankly ahead. The victim's family expressed their grief and anger towards the couple with Daniel's mother describing the crime as horrific and unimaginable. Halseth and Guerrero were sitting stoically as the judge handed down their sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. No visible reaction was seen from either of them as the sentence was announced. The case of Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero shocked the Las Vegas community and gained national attention. Their sentence reflects the severity of their horrific crime, 
with no possibility of release from prison for the rest of their lives. Number 6. Shondell Jackson Back in May 2014, Shondell Jackson and Derek Thomas planned to rob Nathan Potter, a University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee student, and he was walking home from a night out with friends. Jackson and Thomas approached Potter and demanded that he hand over his wallet. When Potter informed them that he didn't have any money, Jackson assaulted him with a firearm and took his life. During the trial, Jackson showed no remorse for his actions and even smiled sarcastically at Potter's family while being escorted out of the courtroom. This callous behavior enraged Potter's family and friends, who were present in the courtroom to witness the sentencing. After being found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide and robbery, Jackson was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. His violent outburst after the sentencing demonstrated the lack of remorse he felt for his actions. Members of his family also reacted negatively, adding to the tension in the courtroom. The judge's decision to sentence Jackson to life in prison without parole was met with mixed reactions. Some felt it was an appropriate punishment for such a heinous crime, while others believed that a lighter sentence would have been more appropriate. However, the judge believed that Jackson's behavior and lack of remorse showed that he posed a danger to society and that he deserved the maximum sentence available under the law. Number 7. Dylan Schumacher Dylan Schumacher was a 16-year-old teenager from Lockport, New York. In 2013, he was convicted of the second degree for the death of a two-year-old boy named Ethan Bigham. In March of 2012, Dylan Schumacher was watching his girlfriend's two-year-old son, Austin Smith, at the Springville home they shared with Schumacher's parents when he lost his temper and fatally injured the boy. Schumacher took the stand during his trial and admitted to slapping, spanking, slamming, and punching the victim. Despite his admission, proving intentional assault was challenging for prosecutors, who had to convince jurors beyond a reasonable doubt that Schumacher intended to take Austin's life. District Attorney Frank Sedita III acknowledged that jurors had a hard time accepting that someone would intentionally cause the death of an innocent child. Following the verdict, Schumacher's lawyer, Joseph Terranova, argued that the jury should have convicted Schumacher for one of the less several serious charges, would have resulted in him being incarcerated until middle age, but spared him a potential lifetime behind bars. The attorney said that his client had been offered a plea bargain with a determinate sentence of 25 years, which could have resulted in his release in 21 years prior to the trial. Sedita, however, denied that his office ever proposed such a deal. Schumacher, who was tried as an adult, may never get out of prison due to the maximum sentence imposed. The deceased child's relatives wept after the verdict not only for Austin Smith, but for his now convicted teenager. Rita Little, the child's maternal great-grandmother, forgave Schumacher and said God would want us to move on. Austin Smith's maternal grandmother, Tracy Smith, sympathized with Schumacher's family and said, Nobody comes out of this unscathed. Number 8. Antonio Barbeau Antonio Barbeau, along with his friend Nathan Papp, committed one of the most vicious crimes in the world. They were both charged with taking the life of Antonio's great-grandmother, 78-year-old Barbara Olson. At the time of the incident, both Barbeau and Papp were 13 years old. The incident occurred in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin in September 2012. Barbeau and Papp planned to steal Olson's money. They broke into her home and attacked her with a hatchet, leaving her to die. The boys stole money and other items from the house before fleeing the scene. They were later arrested and charged with first-degree intentional homicide. In 2013, Barbeau was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for extended supervision after 35 years. Papp was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for extended supervision after 25 years. Both boys were tried as adults due to the severity of their crimes. During the sentencing hearing, several family members of the Olsons read statements in court, expressing their grief and loss. Barbeau's family also spoke, apologizing for his actions and expressing their remorse. Upon hearing the life sentence imposed on him for taking the life of his great-grandmother and robbing her, 14-year-old Antonio Barbeau was visibly emotional and began to cry. His body shook as he slumped in his seat, with tears streaming down his face. The weight of the sentence seemed to have hit him hard, and he appeared overwhelmed with emotion. Number 9. Martise Fuller In March, a jury found Martise Fuller guilty of taking the life of 15-year-old Kaylee Jugga and attempting to assault her mother, Stephanie Jugga. As a result, Fuller received a life sentence in prison without the possibility of supervised release. The sentences for attempted assault and burglary will be served concurrently with each other, but consecutively to the life sentence. Prosecutors argued that Fuller held Kaylee and her mother responsible for the expulsion from school and being removed from the football team. They stated that Fuller, who was 15 years old at the time, carefully planned the crime by obtaining a gun and ammunition from a friend and having a relative dispose of the weapon after the shooting. On May 9, 2019, the mother and daughter were at home preparing to go on a camping trip 
when Fuller entered the house through the open garage. Prosecutors emphasized that Fuller had detailed knowledge of the home and Kaylee's daily routine and had even scoped out the property prior to the attack. He then assaulted Kaylee, who died at the scene, while Stephanie Jugga was shot after encountering Fuller on the second floor of the house. Stephanie Jugga later found her daughter's lifeless body in her bedroom. During the trial, Stephanie expressed her grief, stating that Kaylee had always been her support system and cheerleader, and now she feels lost without her. During the court proceedings, Fuller had the opportunity to speak, but instead his defense co-counsel read a letter he had written. In the letter, Fuller maintained his innocence and placed blame on the media for portraying him as terrible. I want to express my remorse despite the animosity that has been directed towards me. However, I must maintain my innocence, and that is the truth. I hope that in due course, you will all come to realize that I am not the person that the media has falsely portrayed me to be. Number 10. Jennifer Me. Jennifer Ann Me, also known as the Hiccup Girl due to her chronic hiccups, gained notoriety from her television appearances on popular American shows like NBC's Today Show. However, Mee's life took a dark turn when she was arrested in 2010 for a first-degree crime. She was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without parole in 2013. By serving as jurors in this case, your jury service is complete. Author M. William Phelps chronicled her story in a book published in 2016, which garnered renewed national attention for Mee's transformation from media darling to convicted criminal. However, her conviction and sentence had been the subject of criticism, with some alleging that if she were male, she would have received a more lenient sentence. She was arrested for her involvement in the death of Shannon Griffin, a 22-year-old man she lured to a location where two accomplices robbed and fatally assaulted him. Me, who was 19 years old at the time, was convicted of first degree and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Her two accomplices, who were also convicted of first degree, received similar sentences. During the trial, Me's defense argued that she did not intend for Griffin to be hurt and that she didn't know that her accomplices were armed. However, the prosecution argued that Mee was an active participant in the planning and execution of the robbery and death. After the verdict was read, Mee reportedly collapsed in the courtroom and was seen crying and shaking. She was sobbing uncontrollably as she was comforted by her attorney and family members. Despite appeals, Mee's conviction and sentence have been upheld, and she remains in prison. Her case serves as a cautionary tale about how quickly a young person's life can take a tragic turn and the serious consequences that can result from even minor involvement in criminal activity. Number 11. Devin Erickson Devin Erickson is a former student of STEM School Highlands Ranch in Colorado, USA. In May 2019, he and a co-conspirator, Sir Alec McKinney, carried out a school shooting that resulted in the death of one student and injuries to eight others. Erickson was born on December 8, 2000 and grew up in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. He attended STEM School Highlands Ranch where he met McKinney. Erickson was described as a quiet and reserved student who had few close friends. On the day of the incident, Erickson and McKinney entered the school with firearms and began firing. Kendrick Castillo, an 18-year-old senior, rushed the boys in an attempt to stop them and was fatally shot. The youngest victim was reported to be 15 years old. All victims were students and no staff members were harmed. During the attack, three seniors named Kendrick Castillo, Joshua Jones, and Brendan Biley bravely intervened to stop the shooter, later identified as Erickson. The three students leapt from their desks and slammed the gunman against the wall, leading to a struggle in which he fired off several shots. Tragically, Castillo lost his life during the confrontation, and Jones sustained gunshot wounds to his leg and hip, but survived. Despite the odds, Biley managed to overpower and disarm him during the struggle. The last of the wounded students was released from the hospital on May 12th. Erickson and McKinney were eventually apprehended by police. Erickson was charged with 48 counts, including first degree, attempted assault, and conspiracy to take someone's life. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but was found guilty on all counts in May 2021. In October 2021, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 1,282 years. During the trial, Erickson apologized for his actions, saying, I'm very sorry for what I did, and I take responsibility for it. However, he also claimed that he was manipulated by McKinley and that he didn't realize the severity of what they were planning to do. The judge did not find these arguments very convincing at all, stating that Erickson was an active participant in the attack and showed no remorse for his actions at the time. Number 12. Alyssa Bustamante Alyssa Bustamante is a convicted criminal from Missouri who was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 35 years for taking the life of her 9-year-old neighbor, Elizabeth Olton, in 2009. Bustamante was 15 years old at the time and had a troubled background. She was described as a depressed and troubled teen who had a history of self-harm. Without parole, if there was another option, then there would have been no reason to have accepted that offer. 
She's also been on medication for depression and attending counseling sessions. On October 21, 2009, Bustamante assaulted Elizabeth Olton using her hands and a knife. She then buried Elizabeth in a shallow grave in the woods behind her house. Bustamante had reportedly planned the crime for weeks, writing in her diary that she wanted to know what it felt like to take someone's life. Bustamante initially pleaded not guilty to the charges of first degree and armed criminal action, but later changed her plea to guilty. During the sentencing hearing, Elizabeth Olton's family members gave an emotional victim impact statement, and Bustamante herself spoke in court apologizing for her actions and expressing remorse. I just want to say I'm sorry for what happened. I'm so sorry, Bustamante said in court. If I could give my life to get her back, I would. I'm sorry. Despite her apology, the judge sentenced Bustamante to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 35 years, citing the severity of the crime and Bustamante's lack of empathy for her victim. Number 13. Jacob Matthew Morgan Jacob Matthew Morgan, a 17-year-old from York County, was sentenced to 15 years in the Department of Corrections after pleading guilty to involuntary taking the life of Joshua Hill and unlawful conduct of a child for his involvement in the death of the 14-month-old, who is also his half-brother. In March of last year, a fire broke out in the Rock Hill home that Morgan shared with his family, resulting in the death of his baby half-brother Joshua Hill. Prosecutors accused Morgan of starting the fire intentionally, pointing to the evidence that they said that the fire had two points of origin and that Morgan had a fascination with fire. Despite all the evidence against him, Morgan maintained his innocence, entering an Alford plea. During his emotional statement in court, Morgan expressed his love for his brother and his regret for not being able to save him. His family stood behind him, stating that they have always believed in his innocence. Morgan will be on probation for five years after his release and will face 15 years in jail if he violates any of the terms. The victim's family and the suspect's family were the same, making it difficult for the prosecution as both families did not want the case to go to trial. Number 14. Jody Arias Jodi Arias is an American woman who was convicted for the death of her ex-boyfriend Travis Alexander in 2013. She committed the crime when she was a teenager. Arias and Alexander had a tumultuous relationship, which ended in his death in June of 2008. Alexander was found dead in his home with multiple injuries from a sharp weapon and gun. Arias initially denied any involvement in Alexander's death, but later changed her story several times. She eventually claimed that she attacked him in self-defense after he attacked her, but the prosecution argued that the assault was premeditated and that Arias had stalked and harassed Alexander in the months leading up to the unfortunate incident. Arias's trial garnered widespread media attention, and the jury ultimately found her guilty of first-degree murder in 2013. The penalty phase of the trial resulted in a hung jury, but a second penalty phase in 2015 resulted in Arias being sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Throughout the trial, Arias maintained her innocence and made several attempts to appeal her conviction. However, her appeals were ultimately unsuccessful and she remains in prison to this day. Arias was emotional during the trial, often breaking down in tears and at one point even staging a mock attempt to take her own life in the courtroom. However, her behavior was also criticized, with some accusing her of attempting to manipulate the jury with her emotional outbursts. In the footage from the court, Arias can be seen reacting calmly as the verdict is read, showing no outward emotion. Number 15. Aiden Fucci Aiden Fucci, a Florida teenager who assaulted 13-year-old Tristan Bailey with a knife 114 times in 2021, was sentenced to life in prison by a judge. Fucci, who was 14 at the time of the incident, pleaded guilty to first degree in February. According to Smith, Fucci had informed his friends that he planned to take someone's life and discussed leading them into the woods to witness the person bleeding out. The sentence is subject to review in 25 years. Tristan's father, Forrest Bailey, spoke on behalf of his family and expressed pride in his daughter's character and accomplishments. He thanked the judge for the verdict and asked for kindness to be extended to Fucci's family, who are also in pain. Tristan was found dead in woods outside Jacksonville. Fucci was initially accused of second degree but later indicted on a first degree charge. Tristan's family provided emotional accounts during the sentencing hearing, with her sisters speaking about the impact of the crime on their lives. Fucci remained mostly stoic during the court proceedings, while the Baileys embraced each other. After the sentencing, they spoke to the media alongside state attorney and sheriffs. The family members referred to as the Bailey Seven wore white tops that said, That's my squad in aqua, Tristan's favorite color, and Tristan Bailey Strong, written in overlapping fashion like a signature.